A year into the Marcos Jr. presidency, how is Mindanao doing? In last year's State of the Nation address, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. barely mentioned the island group where he won an astonishing 67% of the vote. What can we expect to hear, or rather, what should we insist on hearing about Mindanao from his second sauna next week? Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. We are joined tonight by Driza Liningding, chair of the Moro Consensus Group, zooming in from Marawi. Rappler Mindanao Bureau Chief Herbie Gomez, who is in Cagayan de Oro. And Georgie Engelbrecht, senior analyst of the International Crisis Group, here in the studio. Thank you, Georgie, Herbie, and Driza, for joining us in the public square. Let me start with Herbie. Mindanao overwhelmingly voted for Marcos last year, re-electionist congressman and um, former ARMM Governor Mujib Hataman was on record as saying he was stunned by the scale of victory. Was Marcos's victory with almost 70% of Mindanao's uh, 12 million votes, in fact, a surprise? Can you kindly set the political context here? Um. Maybe uh, in, 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 if, if you thought of uh, uh, Marcos uh, running for president two years or three years uh, before the elections, mm -hmm. that would be surprising. Mm -hmm. But his alliance with, uh, uh, Sara, du with Sara Duterte, mm -hmm. okay, whose father, uh, surprisingly, uh, was very popular, is very, until now, is very popular. Mm -hmm. His alliance uh, was actually, I, I think, it was what carried him in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no one from Mindanao except uh, uh, Manny Pacquiao. Mm -hmm. Pacquiao, uh, Pacquiao, I think, did well in... Sarangani. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, in, mm -hmm. in Sarangani, in the South Sargent region, but uh, was not enough. Uh, still, Mindanao overwhelmingly voted for for Marcos, and I attribute that to Sara Duterte. Mm -hmm. Although uh, during the election period, it looked like uh, it had it didn't have the blessings of uh, uh, the old man Rodrigo Duterte. That's right. But since Sara is a Duterte, then uh, you know. I think it was Sara Duterte who really delivered for Marcos in, in, in Mindanao. Maybe uh, we'll, have we'll have time later to talk about the continuing influence of the Dutertes in Mindanao. Uh, Drisa, uh, you campaigned for Isco Moreno in part because you thought he had the best interests of the Moro community at heart. Mm. Uh, would you assess the Marcos administration's first year in Mindanao, especially regarding the Bangsamoro and post-siege Marawi? Thank you, Sir Jan, and uh, good evening to the uh, to Sir Georgie and Herbie. Generally speaking, uh, I can say that uh, most here in the BARM, especially with the MILF-led BTE and BARM, mm -hmm. are very much satisfied. Are mm -hmm. satisfied, of course, with the, the how the Marcos administration is handling the peace process. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, recently. We are seeing frequent visits of uh, MILF leaders, no less than the Chairman uh, Al Haj Murad and the uh, Chief Minister of Barm in Malacanang. No, uh, we, we we've seen in the news uh, just recently the President uh, witnessed the signing of the circular for the intergovernmental intergovernmental uh, energy board for allowing uh, Barm and the national government to have a joint exploration in some of the natural resources here in Mindanao. So to some, this is a very significant. Uh, actually, to me, no, personally, I, I, I am quite surprised uh, with how he is um, uh, handling the Mindanao peace process and the Bank Samaro because uh, during the campaign and uh, before his bid for presidential uh, presidency, 
we thought he was uh, an anti-Moro or anti anti-Moro rebellion. But uh, it turns out, uh, and also to the frustration of some, like uh, our local government leaders, uh, political warlords, mm -hmm. uh, they thought that uh, President uh, BBM will favor them, no? uh, especially in the appointments uh, of uh, the ET uh, members of the uh, Bangsamoro Transition Authority. So, mm -hmm. yes, this is a quite a surprise but of course there are some uh some uh some, some issues that uh, mm -hmm. uh we are still you know you know like for example there are some sectors who are frustrated in the in the normalization track uh, mm -hmm. uh MILF members mm -hmm. who are expecting uh, from that uh, packages that the government will give them and of course, uh, we are now hearing from the governors themselves uh, that they want the full deactivation of the 40-man MILF members. So we we understand that this is, of course, a politically motivated motivated uh, pronouncements. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally speaking, I can say that uh, the uh, most of the Moros are satisfied with how BBM in his first year actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Dirisa. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, return to the issue of normalization and also of the, uh, the state of rehabilitation in Marawi uh, a little later. Uh, Georgie, uh, thank you for making it all the way to our studio. Uh, you wrote earlier that Marcos Jr. inherited, and I quote, a peace process, an insurgency, and a delicate geopolitical situation. Of course, you were talking about the Philippine situation as a whole. What has he done with that inheritance? as far as Mindanao is concerned, in his first year. Okay, salamat, John, and great to be here. Magdan Gabi. Um, well, with respect to the peace process, I would like to continue what also Driza was saying. Especially in the beginning of his term, there was a lot of uncertainty about the way he will deal with Barm, right? Mm -hmm. For a few months, and even before the elections, we didn't hear much about his specific policy. That's right. So after some time, when we then had the appointments in the BTA, when we had his speech at the UN General Assembly, mm -hmm. and when we had you know, a general commitment to the peace process, he visited Cotabato, mm -hmm. that looked really positive, I think, and mm -hmm. that's why we have the surprising effect. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the downside to it a little bit now into this one here is that these, this peace process is really complex, and a lot of... Um, the devil is in the details, basically. Mm -hmm. And apart from normalization, you have other things that still need to be sorted out. Mm -hmm. And I think there are competing views on how he and, well, the government are doing, are doing this. There are those who say they're really on track, mm -hmm. but others would probably be a bit more critical and say it's a little bit too laissez-faire because there are only two years left until the elections. Normalization is behind. Um, we also see a bit of a concerning situation, I would say, on the ground with respect to local violence. Mm -hmm. And the perception is also what is the government thinking or doing about it? Is it conveniently giving all the responsibility to BARM or is it also having to fulfill part of its deal? So I think for that we still need to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Now with the insurgency, yes. um, of course, the, he continues the path of Duterte vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the CPP and PANDF. Mm -hmm. So he, he made a few changes. Zara Duterte is now head of LCAC. Mm -hmm. um, I think also the, re the rhetorics have gone down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, interestingly, he's the first president who does not seem to want to negotiate with the, with the communists. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and that comes, of course, from the current position where the government perceives it is winning this war. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's, if it's too premature to say because there, there are signs that there's a decline, of course, but you know, with conflict, it can always re-erupt. Um, but we also see a bit of a tweak with, compared to Duterte. Mm -hmm. And with respect to geopolitics, I would say even you know, That's he essentially Ch China-US, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So he continues also what Duterte actually perhaps started in his last two years mm -hmm. when he realized the opening to Beijing doesn't quite work out. But he went one step further, right? <coughs> so we have ETCA, we have the commitment to the alliance. But I still think he tried to, to have a dialogue with Beijing and to have good relations. Mm -hmm. But perhaps at some point he was also forced 
to 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 you know to act and to pursue the current strategy, which is, I think most people say for the Philippines is smart. Like you publicly talk about the situation in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. and I think another journalist called it in a column of today self assurance mm -hmm. to an degree to a degree more assertiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of things, right? Yes. Uh, just a quick follow up, Georgie. Um, does Mindanao play a role? Is it a factor in this geopolitical situation? I think when you, maybe perhaps as a whole, not that much. Mm -hmm. But we, of course, know that you know uh, external actors try to play a role in development assistance, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think for now the theater, it's, it's not that much affected, even though I think there were some signs that, of course, um, the United States, for example, are also supporting development programs in Mindanao. Mm -hmm. There have been some you know, reports about China also thinking about how can they help, mm -hmm. especially during Duterte's time. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not a major theater as of now. Herbie and uh, Driza, if you were to make a list of the three most consequential issues uh, facing Mindanao today. Would you have the same list as the crisis group? Number one, peace process. Number two, insurgency. And then, well, maybe not so much the third one, U.S.-China. Let me start with Herbie and then with Driza. What would your top three most consequential issues be? Yes, John. I, I would lump uh, insurgency and uh, uh, the peace process. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interconnected. Okay. So that's one. Second is peace and order, crime, criminality. Mm -hmm. we, uh, lately, we have, we've been seeing a lot of ambuscades mm -hmm. uh, and violence. In the, uh, despite what uh, 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 Dria Zahir is saying, that uh, uh, in the Bangsamoro region, that satisfaction rating of, of uh, uh, Marcos is uh, relatively high. But I, I would say that at the same time, we're also seeing uh, a lot of violence uh, in the neighboring areas, uh, Sultan Kudarat, uh, in, in the Mabaguindanao provinces. Uh, in Lanao, we just saw this year uh, the governor of Lanao del Sur being, he nearly died because of, of an ambush. Mm -hmm. so there's, uh, there's a problem on peace and order. Okay. Uh, if it's a, any consolation, bombings, there, there were, I think there were a few. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a major problem. And then the third is development. Okay. In Mindanao, uh, I don't know with the barn, but in the rest of Mindanao, there seems to be, if, if you talk to people, there seems to be a dissatisfaction on when it comes to uh, infrastructure development mm -hmm. at the direction that the go this government is taking. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like Kulang. Uh, it's left one thing. And uh, if there's a project, like in, in, in the case of Cotabato City, the mayor of Cotabato just complained the other day or last weekend about a, uh, a, a bridge project there that a retrofitting project that was supposed to have started in 2018 until now it's it's not yet being started by the DPWH so there's mm -hmm. uh, these things the slow the, the snail paced uh, uh, process of development is uh, it's being seen it's quite obvious uh, it's interesting that you made uh, an exception or a, a parenthesis for uh, BARM because uh, it does seem as though there's, there's a lot of development uh, funding going uh, in that direction. So for you, that would be peace process slash insurgency, uh, peace and order, and development. Uh, Driza, what would your top three uh, list look like? Uh I agree with uh, both Georgie and Herbie, but uh, at the top of my list, I think from a local perspective, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is what is uh, most concerning to us. Uh, I, uh, the same with uh, Sir Herbie is uh, actually the peace and order situation here in some areas of uh, the farm, especially with the upcoming uh, 
barangay and SK elections. So we have seen the uh, surge of uh, this, this local violence, killings, ambushes. Uh, but uh, we still, uh, I still don't have the data, but some people are saying that uh, this uh, violence, local violence, is uh, concentrated only in central Mindanao. Uh, we don't know in the island provinces. Some are saying that uh, in the island provinces, uh, they are enjoying uh, relatively more peaceful now compared to central Mindanao. So uh, this is, this is uh, actually an area where we are not seeing the, the intervention of the national government uh, what PBBM's policies towards this uh, mm -hmm. peace and order situation in uh, Mindanao. So uh, this is something that uh, people are, you know, uh, uh, you know, we are, we are feeling kind of anxious, especially with the upcoming barangay and SK election. And we are hoping that the PBM administration uh, could come up with some policy interventions uh, so that uh, uh, we can ensure a peaceful and honest order election in the in the coming election, Sir Henry. So I think peace process. Mm -hmm. uh, another issue, of course, is uh, you know people are not talking, but uh, you know the economy, the inflation. Uh, you know these these are these are some of the issues that ordinary folks here uh, are complaining about. But um, I don't know. But uh, this this. This is yet to, uh, I mean, uh, to reach a uh, sort of level that uh, people will come out and speak. But uh, it's a reality, you know. Uh -huh. uh, if you go to the market, uh, people are uh, prices are uh, soaring high. Uh, so for you, uh, that would be peace and order number one, and then also the, the peace process, and then peace process and economy. Uh, uh, the economy. Uh, quick follow up for you, Driza. Um, uh, we heard uh, Herbie say he will lump the peace process and the insurgency as two issues that actually just one. I, I would think that for the ordinary uh, Filipino news consumer, for instance, uh, ang tingin nila sa Mindanao, uh, it would be peace process slash insurgency slash peace and order. Bale, ang tanong ko, what do you mean by peace and order and why is it separate from yung uh, insurgency slash uh, peace process? When we speak of peace process, uh, of course, this is uh, more focused on the armed uh, rebellion groups like mm -hmm. the MILF mm -hmm. and the MINILF. When we speak of insurgency, of course, we have the uh, remnants of the Maudi, ISIS, mm -hmm. uh, and other... Uh, lawless elements groups here in the barn areas. When we speak of, uh, what's the third one? Um, uh, peace and order. Peace, peace and order. Mm -hmm. You're it's, talking about crime. It's actually a political scenario. When it's we speak of peace and order, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, actually a political. If you look at the killings, uh, the spate of killings here in Mindanao, with the exception of uh, some insurgency operation by the security forces. Most of the killings are put politically motivated. Some of the victims are former LGUs for barangay chairman, uh, government employees, something like that. So this is more of uh, actually a politically motivated uh, killings, if I can say. Thank you. The, the reason I asked uh, all three of you for your you know, list of top three, you know, uh, using George's own list as the basis, uh, is I wanted to uh, find out what do you want to hear from the president when he takes to uh, Congress on Monday? Um, his first sauna, of course, he was just a month uh, into his presidency, was very disappointing if you were a Mindanao observer. Hardly any mention. It was, you know, Mindanao Railway Network, Davao Bus Transit. Uh, that, essentially, that was it, right? But uh, there have been positive uh, developments. Um, he's, he's, I think, a little more at ease. This is my own sense. Uh, in terms of understanding the situation on the ground, what do you 
want to hear from the president. So I'll start with Georgie and then Herbie and then Driza. What do you want to hear from the president on Monday regarding Mindanao? Okay, so for me, it would probably be three things. Mm -hmm. So number one, it's still good to have an assurance from the national government and from the president that he is fully supporting the peace process. Mm -hmm. um, I think this commitment is important. It mm -hmm. can give confidence. Mm -hmm. And especially at a time when the situation inside BARM, politically speaking, is contentious, okay. I think it sends a good signal. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think he also needs to make a point that the elections should be conducted in a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a president, I think um, we know that political violence is a reality, is a fact, mm -hmm. but especially the series of these incidents, like Driza said, over mm -hmm. the last, I would even say less than a year, I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it took for quite some time. It is a bit concerning, especially in some pockets of Maguindanao, in some areas that are a bit scattered in Mangsamoro. You see this trend, mm -hmm. and I think as the president, there needs to be a good statement, a policy statement perhaps, but also things need to be implemented to make sure the barangay elections in 2025 yeah. Yeah. Will, be, will be managed because it would be dangerous just to say it will be okay somehow, mm -hmm. it will work out. Okay. Um, and the third, I would also underline what Riza said, is about um, development and the economic situation. Mm -hmm. Also, when I've been traveling in Mindanao in the last months, this is something that came up in many conversations. Mm -hmm. The price of goods, the situation of some farming communities, mm -hmm. and the divide between maybe some urban center areas where growth happens, but then areas that are left behind. And I think, you know, in theory, this is also one of the reasons why conflicts continue. Mm -hmm. And I think we had a lot of um, public debate about the sugar crisis, the agriculture thing, and at some point, I think there needs to be also a vision that Mindanao should like continue mm -hmm. be doing better despite mm -hmm. the circumstances, right. because the pandemic hangover is mm -hmm. still there, mm -hmm. and and people feel it actually. So I, I actually double checked the poverty incidence rate mm -hmm. in some of the provinces in Mindanao. So from 2018 to 21, mm -hmm. there was an increase in a couple of those: mm -hmm. Zamboanga del Norte, part of Caraga. Mm -hmm. um, and in BARM, even though there was improvement, it's still, in, in some ways, uh, a challenging place with respect to socioeconomic situation. Thank you. Herbie, what would, your, what would you expect the president to say? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to, to hear from him a list of uh, his uh, concrete accomplishments in Mindanao, not just plans, mm -hmm. because plans, uh, uh, I, I read a, a, a report about uh, Speaker Romualdez mm -hmm. uh, praising the president for his uh, <laughs> for a comprehensive for doing a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. But a comprehensive plan is a plan. It's it's it's, it's not material. I, I want to hear something concrete from him in his first twelve months in office. Mm -hmm. Exactly what did he do? in Mindanao, what pro projects were accomplished. And I also want to hear from his son during his son what he intends to do in the short term, meaning uh, in the next, the, the next following, year. not in 2028. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what does he want to accomplish in Mindanao uh, next year or in the next year? Thank you. So what did you do and what do you want to do in the next uh, year? Uh, and Riza? Yes, uh, I share some of the uh, wishes and hopes of uh, Georgie and Herbie. But for me specifically, uh, this is what I missed in our earlier discussions, uh, Jan, no? because I am an advocate for the uh, safe and dignified return of the Marawi IDPs, mm -hmm. which until now is still an IDPs. We are still an IDPs, although yes. mm -hmm. we have uh, significant development because of the Marawi Compensation Board is now rolling, and hopefully by the third this year, uh, we the, the board will uh, start the payment of those uh, uh, destroyed uh, structures during the five-month uh, Marawi seats, but. Uh, from the previous Suna and until now, there is no concrete uh, statements coming from the, the president with regards to Marawi IDPs. 
what we are hearing is that uh, yeah, tapos na yan, uh, because the president the, the president Duterte did his uh, That's right. uh, did his best mm-hmm. but uh, you know what he didn't know is that until now the majority of the IDPs are still staying in the temporary shelters so the status is uh, as as days goes on is uh, you know very very difficult for them because mm-hmm. uh, unlike before the folk, uh, uh, m- most of the agencies are focusing on their livelihood, but now uh, this seems to be forgotten. Some of the temporary shelters are up to, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the contracts are ending. So the fate of these uh, people staying in the temporary shelters is still uncertain. So this is what uh, troubling their their mind right now. Um, until now, most of the projects in the main affected areas, the mega, pro- mega projects in the Marawi rehabilitations uh, were not turned over. Uh, mm-hmm. Hindi pa ito nagagamit, no? This, 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 this infra- mega infrastructure not being utilized. So I fear that uh, if this uh, goes on, baka pagdating ng panahon, hindi namin magamit itong mga, for example, the stadiums, the roads because uh, it's still restricted mm-hmm. masira na ito hindi pa namin nagagamit so i'm hoping that uh, from the sona this monday the president will uh, will have a statement not that we are not happy with how we sending the, the Malawi compensation board but uh, we want an assurance from the government that uh, you know pabalikin na yung mga tao for a, for a safe and dignified Return whether nabayaran or hindi. Let's mm-hmm. open. Let's return the Marawi affected areas or the ground zero to the people of Marawi. Because until now, it is still restricted and occupied by the military. I, I think we can all agree that, uh, as you had written before, Georgie, that uh, Marawi is a scar that is uh, in need of healing. Right? I mean, uh, so we need uh, the president to fully back the, the return of the internally displaced persons and to back the rehabilitation and uh, development of uh, Marawi. I was just struck, you know, so we, our wish list, you know, of course, uh, very different things. Uh, Georgie, uh, in a way, you, you wanted to highlight the, the character of the presidency as a bully pulpit and also as the source of, uh, you know, uh, all authority in the Philippines. Uh, you want the president to belabor the obvious, but it's a it's a it's a necessary belaboring of the obvious that he supports the peace process, that he uh, uh, warns people against uh, violence in the elections uh, and so on. And in Herbie's case, I think he, <laughs> I think it's more like uh, make an honest man out of the president. No? The president enjoys. Uh, uh, as uh, Drisa said, uh, high levels of satisfaction in Mindanao. Uh, it's possible that uh, he is now coming into his own uh, source of uh, goodwill here. It's not just riding on the Duterte's uh, base. But Herbie is saying, tell us what you did. Exactly what have you done? And uh, what do you plan to do in the next several months? I mean, you know, not not talk pie in the sky, and so on. Um, there's really a lot. And I'm, I'm really hoping that the president will take the opportunity on Monday to say something about uh, something specific about Mindanao. Um, I have a question for Georgie and uh, Driza. Uh, sorry, this will bring us uh, crashing down to earth uh, again. Um, so, this could be under a peace process or under um, peace and order. Uh, last month, there was a really disturbing incident. Uh, seven persons uh, were killed in a law enforcement operation. Uh, but according to the MILF, these seven were in fact MILF uh, members. Um, my question for both Georgie and Riza, could this have been prevented? Was it inevitable? Does it say anything important about how Marcos is uh, approaching Mindanao uh, or approach Mindanao in his first year in office? Georgie, first. Well, I think the first thing to note is it's not the first time an incident like this happened 
during his time. Mm -hmm. We had the, the, the encounter last November between the MILF and the AFP in Basilan. Mm -hmm. And even in the last year, like year of, of Duterte, we had incidents like this. So technically, there's always a chance that they will happen. Mm -hmm. The question is, will they derail the peace process? Mm -hmm. Like Mama Sapano did mm -hmm. significantly because things got delayed because of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they will derail it, but of course the message they send is, is something uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think incidents like this are never inevitable. They can always be prevented. And in fact, there has been a mechanism to prevent these very incidents with respect to the government and the MILF. The whole ceasefire architecture mm -hmm. has been very, you know, operating well in the past years. Mm -hmm. But of course there are hiccups. And mostly they evolve around the targets of operations that the government needs to conduct and the location of these targets. And if it's an MILF area, in theory, the coordination needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, there are those who advocate that since now we have BARM, this is not needed anymore because the MILF should abide by the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And they should also turn over people who are involved in allegedly criminal activities mm -hmm. so that these things will not happen in the first place. But from the other perspective, more than 10,000 MILF combatants are still not disarmed. Mm -hmm. They're on the ground. Mm -hmm. So we need protocols. And we need them for every security agency. Uh, we need it for the police, the AFP, the, the PDEA, and so forth. And in most times, tensions are prevented. But then there are always things like this. And I think the lesson is don't take the ceasefire for granted. Mm -hmm. And also work out the remaining questions that exist about the nitty-gritty parts of the ceasefire protocol. Then something like this hopefully will not happen. But my feeling is the tense the political climate is, also in BARM, mm -hmm. the more these incidents can trigger a response from politicians, mm -hmm. from the media, mm -hmm. even from within the MIL itself. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very important to preserve the ceasefire because it sends also a message of confidence. And the current insecurity is the exact opposite. It sends a message of uncertainty mm -hmm. and harm. I have a follow-up for you, but uh, let me hear from Driza first. Driza, what, what is your own view here uh, about this, this most recent uh, unfortunate incident? Yes, no, just like what Georgie is saying, that this is not actually the first time. Uh, this has been actually some of our uh, claim or before, no? especially during the administration of uh, President uh, Duterte. But uh, uh, one of the surprising uh, development here is in, in, the, in the recent case of the seven MILF killed, I think this is the first time that uh, MILF leadership uh, came up with a statement owning the membership of this, uh, of this uh, killed uh, persons. Because in the past, especially during the uh, time of Duterte administration, uh, the perception of some, no, including me, is that uh, the MILF is, uh, you know, is silent. Even some of the victims are, are the members, but now they are speaking. I don't know if this is a good development or not, but we are seeing a development here that the, finally the MILF is speaking against this mm -hmm. uh, uh, violation of uh, protocols mm -hmm. and uh, mechanisms. So. Uh, my take here is that uh, there is a need for the president to understand the complexities of the mechanism. Uh, I understand that the MILF now is uh, calling for the return of the monitoring team no, mm -hmm. to ensure that the mechanisms in place before, which is uh, 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 proven to be you know, uh, working before, uh, needs to be in place again with the presence of the international monitoring team. So. This is something that uh, <clears throat> we're also waiting uh, on what the BBM administration's uh, uh, response on this uh, uh, request from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So I think the situation in the ground is, uh, uh, what is this, being complicated by the upcoming uh, SQ elections uh, because um, the anti-MILFs or even anti-MNLF, they can easily come up with uh, with cases against uh, members of the MILF and uh, they can utilize the security forces against these uh, people who, whom they perceive as threat to their political, uh, uh, political uh, what is this, political uh, 
future because MILF now the, is a threat to many of the political leaders here in the Barm regions. So this is, I think, what uh, for me is what is complicating the situation now. Recently, the Bang, Bang Samoro Governor's Caucus came, came up with a statement that uh, uh, they want the uh, rule of law to uh, to be enforced here in Mindanao. So their perception is that uh, laws are not being followed because of this uh, peace mechanism. So they are seeing the peace process now as uh, actually as illegal. No, uh, this is this this uh, to me. This is uh, my understanding is that this is their view. No, I don't know if Georgie said this uh, kind of uh, interpretation also. But to me, that that statement alone is. Uh, is uh, complicating the uh, the present peace process and the uh, peace and order situation here in the barn areas. Uh, unfortunately, it is us, the ordinary people and the residents who will be affected with uh, political uh, maneuvering from uh, from both sides. Thanks, Riza, for raising the, the the point about the international monitoring team. That's the follow-up question I want to ask, uh, Georgie. In a previous reincarnation, you were a member of the International Monitoring Team. Uh, what, is it possible for uh, the IMT to return? What would, be, what would be the conditions for its return? Well, I think people have been speculating and thinking about it since last year. Mm -hmm. But I think, practically speaking, it doesn't look like they will come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, both sides need to agree but we only had actually the first formal meeting of both panels of government and my left just a few weeks ago in Davao. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of a lack of communication, perhaps, and a lack of commitment to a fixed decision on some questions that need immediate answers, a lot of things have been hanging, including this. For me personally, I think there are other ways how you can create confidence on the ground. Like, of course, IMT has been working you know, before BARM. So right now, I do understand the point that you can adapt the mechanism. And we had local systems as well in place that worked with both sides and the IMT, representatives of civil society, and Riza also knows it, I think, different NGOs that were well organized and that actually brought forward the community perspective here. And I think that could also work, provided they're, given this they're, they're being given this chance. But I'm not sure if this is also very feasible because from the perspective of the government, they have the current mechanism now that seemingly works. Maybe there's no need to rock the boat mm -hmm. because it's still holding. But on the other hand, we see all these incidents. And perhaps the question that government should ask itself is, okay, what is the most effective way to prevent really difficulties along the way? Mm -hmm. Because perhaps they think they can manage. Nothing will happen. But like Driza said, the statement of the MILF was also very clear. Things are getting complicated because of politics. So it seems like the rice cooker is, you know, cooking and what will happen if the temperature increases? But as much as, you know, many people would wish for the IMT to come back, the issue here is about practicality. And we also know that it's politically sensitive with different nations contributing, mm -hmm. Malaysia having a lead part there. And I think these questions cannot be quickly resolved and the clock is ticking. So that's the tricky part there. That is tricky. Uh, we're running long, so let me just ask a couple more questions. Uh, the, first one, uh, the next one is for Herbie. Herbie, you, you did talk about uh, uh, the, the rise in the perception of uh, peace and order problems. The Mindanao Development Authority issued the results of a survey recently which found that perceptions about violence in Mindanao supposedly had gone down markedly. What should we make of that uh, MINDA study? That, that's a self-serving survey. It came from MINDA. That's <laughs> I, 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 uh, let us see, but uh, it doesn't seem to reflect what's really happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. It might be a part of a perception. <laughs> I, I think it's part of the uh, no, it's part of the sauna. <laughs> it's well, uh, so I, my last question is for all, all three of you, and I want to talk about uh, the Duterte as a factor. No? So, uh, first, Sara Duterte is the uh, first president, a uh, vice president from Mindanao after Gingona and Pilaes, I think, right? 
Uh, but I think she's also quite different from them. I mean, she seems to have more power and certainly more influence than either Emmanuel Pelaez in the 1960s or Gingona uh, in the early 2000s. Also, secondly, the former president is back on the airwaves. <laughs> Sometimes with some criticism of the Marcos administration. I'd like to ask you, how, what should we make of this? How should we think of the Dutertes as a factor uh, in the first year of Marcos uh, as regards Mindanao? Um, maybe I'll start with Herbie and then uh, Driza and then end with Georgie. John, I, I think the Dutertes... Uh are showing their gun in the holster. <laughs> this is a gun in the holster approach. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah being in the cabinet mm -hmm. as education secretary. So the, the loyal, ally, supposedly the loyal ally of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the president. But the father is, you know, doing another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I see it as a gun in the holster. Okay. So, and then BBM knows, Marcos knows that uh, the, the Duterte's uh, command a lot of votes or support in Mindanao. So he has to do a lot of balancing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's like balancing on the on a tightrope, you know. Mm -hmm. So he has to you know balance things. <laughs> Balancing on a tightrope with a gun in your holster, uh, very difficult. <laughs> uh, Driza, uh, your view. Yes. Yes, Sir John, no, as to Sarah Duterte as uh, third president in the one, I think uh, does not, um, does not, uh, right now, does not so, uh, what, what's your space and about it, it uh, because we just transitioned from uh, Mindanao One presidency, so mm -hmm. medyo hindi natin nararamdaman na uh, we have a Mindanao One vice president right now because galing tayo sa pagiging presidente mm -hmm. ng Mindanao One. No? But uh, one thing is uh, showing right now no, with uh, what Sir is saying that uh, the Duterte needs to do a lot of balancing. I think it's more of a political positioning for 2025 and uh, beyond because uh, we know the Duterte's uh, need their presence to be felt and uh, to be heard uh, so that the people will continue to follow them because uh, some of the Duterte allies will be re-electing, no? The Senator Bato, Senator Bongo. Mm -hmm. So they need their presence in the political arena to, uh, to maramdaman ng mga tao gearing towards the 2025. So that's my take. And uh, when it comes to influence, uh, I agree, no, the 30 still commands a lot of uh, uh, what is this following from Mindanao. So uh, we cannot, uh, the BBM, uh, siguro nakikita natin that uh, the administration is uh, of BBM, although sometimes it's been criticized by the 30, is, uh, no, na hindi, nila, hindi nila pinapatulan ito because uh, he understand um, uh, anong meron kay Duterte. That's my take, Sir Chad. Thank you. And Georgie? I mean, from my perspective, looking a bit externally, I also have more questions than answers. <laughs> because I find it interesting that, you know, the former president still has this rapport with the Bangsamoro, mm -hmm. that the name carries a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen him once in Darapanan talking to a variety of uh, Moro Mujahideen and the impression he made on them. So I think you can understand where this kind of connection comes from. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you wonder, what is the, what is, what's the deal? And of course, if you're a bit cynical, it's everything through the lens of 2028, mm -hmm. and then of course 2025. But I also don't really know if there's already an agenda one year after the election of this president, mm -hmm. if we should look at all these developments from the lens of this cutthroat politics that sometimes seemingly takes over. So I guess it just means more reading the tea leaves and then figuring it out. Maybe I'll end with one more question for you, Georgie. I know that you try to talk to quote unquote normal folks, right? I mean, you know, not part of the political class and so on. What, what, what do you think explains Duterte's continuing popularity with the normal folks in Mindanao? Well, I think even during his presidency, like, 
He has this reputation of getting things done, mm -hmm. particularly in a system where sometimes what Herbie also said before, things take time, bureaucracy, etc. He delivered in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, the optics of the machinery of the government were also there, but at the end of the day, he also gave the Bangsamoro the barm. Mm -hmm. Even though Aquino started it and so forth, he was the one. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that also cannot be easily forgotten. It's just that there were also so many other things in the equation that make his persona so, so complex. And I think even the, the people recognize it to an extent. You know, uh, I can, as a uh, native of Mindanao, continue this conversation. I would like to continue this conversation, but uh, our time's up. Uh, thank you, Driza Liningding in uh, Marawi. Yes. Herbie Gomez, our very own Herbie Gomez in Cagayan de Oro. And Georgie uh, Engelbrecht uh, here in the studio. Your insights help us make sense of the public square in Mindanao. Thank you again. That's it for us tonight. As always, the next step for engaged citizens is to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.